hot water bottles. There's all that some water. Sarah, do you want water? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Tim, want water? I'll get sure. you some water. start with a new song that we've never sung before, but it's really simple. And it just goes, turn it over to Jesus three times, and then you can smile the rest of the day. <laughs> and so you can start smiling as soon as we sing it. <laughs>
Okay.
whose face the King of Kings this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way in our hearts this morning. Have your way in your people this morning, Lord God. Touch them, O God, in Jesus' mighty name, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. On a
Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to do one more. One more song for the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. How great is our God. If you all know this one, glory to God. This thing a little wobbly. Praise you, Jesus.
praise this morning. Hallelujah. Let's just dwell in his presence. Let's dwell in his presence. Oh 
the position. Worship ministers to his heart and allows him to minister to our heart. But we have to come into his presence. Amen. Otherwise he cannot minister to us. Hallelujah. We've been praying all morning. We're going to keep praying. We're not done yet. So let's just bow our heads if you're joining with us online. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you are good. You are so very good and you are with us. So Lord, as we come before you in the name of Jesus, pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to each of each heart, every person who is watching. Now, Holy Spirit, you will give us ears to hear what you are saying to us. Now, Holy Spirit, you will anoint our minds, give us the mind of Christ to understand. And Holy Spirit, plant it in our hearts that we might go out not the same way we came in. Glorify the name of Jesus in us and through us and among us. In your holy name, amen. amen. Now, um, oh, I'm continuing a series. Um, Jen, can you turn it down just a little bit? Thank you, just echoing a lot. Thanks. Um, I'm continuing a series I haven't wanted to speak on. I've been wanting to avoid it, but I can't avoid it, so I have to speak it. And, and it's for good, even though there's rough stuff. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 to 6. Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 to 6. <coughs> now, before we get into it, I'm just going to give you the context very briefly. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the voice of the Father was heard speaking over the Son, saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. As the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, that this Jesus is the spotless Lamb, the one who takes away the sin of the world. That this is God's holy Messiah, the Christ, God's lamb, God's offering. That the pleasure of the Father is in him. And John, as he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then God himself spoke. All of that happened. But then in the meantime, John was cast into prison. And in prison, doubts not at his heart. And so John sent two disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or do we look for another? 
Now, Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John, or tell John, again, those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, this is hard. This is where the wrestling has come in. Um, there are two commandments that fulfill all of the law and the Psalms and the prophets. Love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. These are the, the two that fulfill everything else. If you've broken, if you break any other law, you've broken these two. You haven't loved your neighbor. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to cheat them. You're not going to lie to them. You're not going to gossip against them. You're not going to do a whole bunch of stuff. If you love God, you're going to obey him. You're going to walk with him because you want to. Not because if you're going to want to conform that would just be an outward. Your lips can honor him, but then your heart's far from him. But if you love God, you will want to honor him. You, nobody's going to have to tell you. Just for, for those of you who are married, um, I'm going to pick on Brother Mark. Um, <laughs> God, God. <laughs> because um, I love you, and, and thankfully you're not saying love me less. <laughs> uh, so, um, I don't have to give you a list of uh, say, these are the things don't do to your wife. Don't beat her, don't lie to her, don't cheat against her, don't do all of these things, any of you, different, and, and, and still, Eleanor, don't do those things to your husband. You don't need that list. Oh, shucks. No, if you love each other, you won't do that. You don't need a list, because you love each other. Because love fulfills the law. Amen? God's requirements are fulfilled in love. Love is the fulfillment of everything. So there are two you're called to love. God and people. Now, I'm getting to something here. Those two will offend you. Oh boy, that's where it got quiet. <laughs> God and people will offend you. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed is he who shall not be offended in me. You think, well, why would Jesus offend anybody? I mean, that sounds good. How can we be offended by God? We, we figure out how we can be offended by people. We're going to look at that <laughs> next Sunday. Uh, but it's a bit of a double whammy because God works through people. So that means people can offend you and God working through people can also offend you, which means you get double offended. Oh my goodness, that just gets nasty. Um, why would Jesus be offensive? Why would Jesus be offensive? He said, the blind receive the sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached to them. All of those are good things. So why would they be offensive? Why would anybody get offended about that? Well, unless you're planning a funeral and everything depended on burying the guy, and now he's alive, and insisting that you're not supposed to bury him now because he's just been raised from the dead. I can see how that maybe could crash the party. But, you know, nothing ruins a good funeral like, you know, not being dead anymore. Um, and, and, and present to hear what everybody saying about you. They're saying all these nice things about me. <laughs> uh, hopefully, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and then say, you know, just leave enough of the funeral lunch for me to now. Um, and, and don't put me in a hole, please. Um, but how could... Blind seeing, lame walking, lepers being cleansed, deaf hearing, dead living, and the poor made rich, the captives being set free, how could that be offensive? Now, the Pharisees often got upset when Jesus did things. Frequently. It, it seemed to happen all the time. Every time something happened, the Pharisees got upset. People got upset. It's really interesting when you look at it, you think, why did they get upset? Well, sometimes the timing was off. Jesus insisted on doing things on the Sabbath. That was incredibly annoying. Now, some of you aren't going to like this and you're going to be offended. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that in a cavalier, uncaring way. I don't care about you. I do care about you. But I, I love you, and I have, my love for you is greater than my fear of offending you. I'd rather offend you in 
love, if that's what it takes. Jesus did things on the Sabbath. On the holy day, you're not supposed to do any work. Jesus ministered to people. That got him in a lot of trouble. One day he healed someone, and the first he said, you have six days of the week. You have all six of them. Not Shabbat. You have all the other days. By the way, just for reference, that's Saturday. The Sabbath. Um, you have every other day. To do it, to heal people. Why are you insisting on doing it now? Well, because that's when everybody gathered is now. I mean, what better time? It's a lot easier to treat people when they come together in a hospital than it is to go hunt them down in their homes. Um, so, so when you gather, that's when you're going to get healed. And we gather on Shabbat to honor God. And Jesus said, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man because you need it. That bug people. Oh, this guy is a troublemaker, my goodness. He insisted on healing people. He cast out demons. That got people offended. They said, well, it must be by Beals above the prince of demons, and he's casting out demons. Why? Why were they getting so offended? They got offended at the time. They got offended about what he did, when he did it, to whom he did it. He's hanging out with sinners. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Sinful, disgusting people. Wow. Isn't that lovely? Uh, doesn't that express the joy and the heart of the commandments there? When you call people disgusting? And the Pharisees did. Read John 9. They said, these people are cursed. They're so disgusting. They don't know the law. When a man who was born blind was healed, they kicked him out saying, you're cursed. Out you go. We don't want anything to do with you. Read chapter, chap, John chapter 9. It's heart-wrenching. Powerful, though. Why were people getting offended? Because it went a little deeper than just the time. And a little deeper than the people. And I'm going to bring it really home now. Why would we get offended in Jesus? Because this was not written only for the benefit of those who lived almost 2,000 years ago. It's a letter addressed to Chris Suka. It's a letter addressed to Christopher Poulin. It's addressed to each and every one of us, Pastor Zhao. Each and every one of us, this is written to. Why would we get offended in Jesus? Why on earth could we get offended in the one whom we just finished praising? I, I love, by the way, the order of the worship because it was so wonderful starting with, with the cross, and now we're praising the one who lives forever. Amen? Amen. And we're coming into his presence because he who died also lives. He who lives reigns. He who reigns is returning. Amen? I mean, then we have every reason to praise him. So why would we get offended if we're coming to praise him? Why would that happen? And people do get offended. People get offended. Why? Um, new creation was birthed out of deliverance, and that got a lot of people offended. Someone needed deliverance. Praise God. Jesus came to set the captives free. The captives were set free, and a whole bunch of other people got upset and left. Why? Why? Why would they get offended by the Jesus that they love? Why would we be offended? And it happens now. And if you're not careful, it'll happen with you. Because it's written to us, who are here now. Why would we get offended? Well... See, all of these things Jesus was doing, lame, blind people seeing, lame people walking, lepers being cleansed, deaf hearing, dead living, and the poor made rich, and the poor of the gospel preached them, that makes them rich. These are called signs and wonders. They're things. And the things point to the substance. The sign isn't the substance, but it points to the substance. It's a sign saying, this way. So Jesus said, tell John the things that you see and hear. These things are confirmation that I am who I say that I am. Jesus is, by the way, the great I am, made flesh. Jesus said, tell John those things which you do hear and see, verse 4. Because these things, these things are signs and wonders. They're signs and they make us wonder when we see them. Uh, that's why they're called signs and wonders. I'm, I'm being silly, but it's, it's true. That's why. We wonder, what just happened? 
dead people aren't supposed to be living. Lame people don't go around walking. You know, I mean, if you heard the story about the, the guy who broke his leg and he went to the doctor, the doctor said, well, yep, yep, my, my prescription is limp uh, for, your, for your broken leg. This is just you take up limping for the next little while. It means you're not walking, you're limping. But Jesus comes along and lame people aren't limping anymore. They're running. There's an old song that says, you know, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Go after the, the lame guy. Um, if, if you can catch him. <laughs> Nobody can catch him now. Um, you know, ask the deaf guy, and he won't answer. A, he'll hear you and tell you all about it. These things are called signs and wonders. They point to the substance. The substance of Jesus, the presence of Jesus does something. Where Jesus is, stuff happens. Okay, And it's the stuff, the signs and the wonders, that bug us. Why would that even be? Isaiah 8, 18 says that I and the children the Lord have given me are for signs and wonders in Israel by the Lord of hosts. Um, Jesus said these signs and wonders declare the presence, my presence, that I am who I say, even who you say that I am. Uh, Mark 16 says, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils or demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They will do all of these things. They will lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. All of these signs and wonders shall follow us. And there's too many of us. Us is a very broad category. But it includes everybody who's sitting in these seats right now. These signs shall follow Brother Ray. These signs shall follow Sister Alice. They shall follow Brother Jeff. Every single person who is here. Those who believe. That's the qualifier. Do you believe? Yeah. You believe? Yes. Then these signs shall follow you. Amen. If you believe. Now, here's the problem. Again, so what is it then about signs and wonders specifically? Because that's the thing that was getting people offended. Some guy gets healed on the Sabbath. not supposed to do that. Um, you're not supposed to hang out with tax collectors. They're way too sinful. Jesus came for sinners. Um, you qualify? You're a sinner? Yes? Good. That's why he came. Um, he came for every, everybody who would need him, which is everybody. There's nobody who doesn't need him. Why would the signs and wonders, though, specifically offend the Pharisees and us? Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Second Thessalonians. I have a very hard time saying that. But if you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It comes out usually 2 Thessalonians or. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 9. And a few verses after. See, about a month ago, I preached a message called God the Box Buster. God doesn't fit in a box. But I want to look at why would we even have a box in the first place. Um, see, okay, what is the box? I want to define it before we look at these verses. I want to read them. But, but I want to define what the box is. What box? I don't see a box. Who told me there's a box? Uh, what's the box? The box is your theology, your knowledge of God, or what you think you know about God. That's your box. Um, Solomon built a temple. It's a picture of the box. Second Chronicles chapter six. Solomon builds the temple. The temple is massive. It's, it was one of the wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world. It was massive, beautiful, covered in gold and cedar. It had massive stones, none of which could be shaped on site. They all had to be sh shaped off site and then brought on site and fit perfectly, and they all did. It was a, a wonder of the world. It was one of the most magnificent structures the world has ever seen. Now Solomon takes this massive building in his prayer and dedicates it to the Lord. I'm getting to explaining the box. He takes this massive temple, dedicates it to the Lord. He says, Lord, you, the heavens cannot contain you, neither can the earth, much less this temple I've built for your name. Yet please see fit to put your name there. That when your people pray towards the place, you'll hear them put your name on the box. This is the box I've made. It's really beautiful, but I'm recognizing it's a box. 
and you don't fit. So please set your name on it. See, most, most of us, and you can be as wise as Solomon, you can have a lot of knowledge about God, you can have a lot of experience about God, but God, God will honor your box, but he will not fit in it. God responded to Solomon, he said, Yes, Solomon, I have heard your prayer. When my people are called by my name, when they turn and pray towards this place, I will hear them. I will hear from heaven. If they turn, if, if they turn from their wicked ways, if they humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The context of that passage, I mean, it has a lot more uses, but the immediate context of that passage is God saying, yes, Solomon, I will honor your box. I will honor. I, but God doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. He can't. God is infinite. That you can't contain him. The heavens he won't fit. The earth he ain't going to fit. Much less new creation, evangelical church building. Much less your little body where that he says, but don't you know that you are the temple of God? So, so, so the box is your understanding of God. Why would we put God in a box? And that's what I want to get to. Why do we have the box? Why, why must we have a box? Well, I'm get, going to get at that. Because passages, this one included, and there are others like it. I'm not going to get into all of them. We don't have time. Uh, we are all hoping that lunch will one day come, uh, preferably before the Lord comes. So we're going to look at some of them. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 9. Even him who is coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they shall believe a lie. Okay. This is the word of God. The reason why we make a box is because you read this passage, others like it, and fear <coughs> grips our heart. We think, oh no. Oh dear, there's an enemy out there waiting to lie and deceive and is going to do stuff to deceive and he could deceive me. Jesus said even the elect might be deceived if that were possible. So that idea grabs hold of our mind and our heart. It's the heart really where it lodges and causes the most problem. And so therefore, we, we say, well, Lord, I need discernment. I need to know truth from the false. I have prayed that prayer. Very specifically, I said, Lord, I need to hear your voice, and I need to know your voice so well that I can recognize the voice of the enemy because I'm scared silly. I don't want to hear the voice of the enemy, but I need to recognize the voice of the enemy, but I want to know your voice. Amen? Uh, so discernment is good. You need that. You need discernment. You need to know the truth from the, the truth from the false. However, when we see things like this, what we tend to do in our box, and this is where it's going to get offensive, and some of you might get upset. And I love you enough that I'm going to risk getting upset. What we do when we hear that, okay, God does signs and wonders, but Satan might do lying signs and wonders. So what I'm going to do to make a measure of discernment for myself in my own mind, I'm going to put God in the box. Then if anything does not line up to my experience of God, or my knowledge of God, it has to be the devil. And that's what we do, practically. Again, some of you, I'm sorry, you're getting upset. That's okay. It's okay that you're getting upset. The reason is, why do, so, so we do that, so we say, okay, if God does A, B, and C, if I see some E happen, it's not of God, because God does A, B, and C. E doesn't happen. It's not supposed to happen. So therefore, anything that's outside of the box can get accredited to Satan. Well, it's obviously Satan. And therefore, we don't need to ask Holy Spirit. We don't need to really pray. We don't really need to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus who called us. And we can just say, no, if, if, if there is this box, anything outside of it is wrong. Why is this bad? Why, why, what would be the problem with that? I mean, that would be easy. And that's what we tend to do. Okay, I've done it. I'm raising my hands here. I'm, I'm not just saying this. To, I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm saying that I've been there. Okay, I mean, I, I could write the book on, on box building for God, and I could then write it like the follow up box busting from God. Uh, every nice box of God torn apart. They were nice, but they couldn't contain God. Why is this an issue? 
because you need to understand, we need to have a little bit of an understanding of the nature of God and a little bit of an understanding of the nature of the liar, the deceiver. God is infinite. He is the uncreated creator. He has no beginning. He has no end. There is no time. There is no space. He made everything. And everything else is finite. God alone is infinite. So all of the finite has to be within him who is infinite. Him who is boundless. You can't search the ends of him. You're not going to find them. His knowledge, his glory, his holiness, his majesty is beyond your finding out. Just when you think you know, he alone is infinite. And he made, the Bible opens with a short verse, but it's so powerful. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made all things. And there is nothing apart from him. Nothing exists apart from him. You know, John 1 echoes the words of Genesis. John 1 verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. God is infinite. Do we understand that? God is infinite, as much as we can understand infinity. Everything else he made is limited, including Satan. Satan is limited. Comparing the two is like comparing a sardine to the ocean it's swimming in. That, that, that's a... About it, the unlimited nature of God and the very limited nature of the liar, of the deceiver, who does do lying signs and wonders. So when many of us as, as believers, and again, I could have written the book on, on putting God in the box, we have a very limited list of what we think God can do. And we have a very big list of what we think Satan can do. And we think that anything that's not on that list, of Satan can probably do it. There are so many problems to this. One, you're focusing on Satan rather than God. You're not listening to the Lord's voice. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep know me, they hear my voice. If you know his voice, you'll know the one who's doing things because you know him. Now, well, we don't have to know him very well if we come up with an artificial construct. This is a little bit harder. Also, I, I want you to notice something. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, but that they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. That's verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. The love of the truth. If you seek the Lord, you seek to hear his voice, you will understand that Satan is quite limited. He has a lot of ability to, to lie, yes. He can do a lot of things. But he is still incredibly limited. And God is completely unlimited. God will honor your box. He won't fit in it. If you think God will fit in it, you're in for something else. God will not fit in your understanding. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither is entered into the heart of man all that God has for those who love him. You, we don't get it. And, and honestly, and this is going to be offensive as well, it's okay not to get it. It's okay to realize that you don't know everything there is to know about God. He's infinite, you're not. As, as one worship leader used to say, God is God and you aren't. And that's really good. Because in that place, I'm free to look to the one who is God, to look to the one who does, who, who can do anything. And, and when I recognize him, I can recognize the counterfeit. I can look at who is receiving glory in this moment. Is it Jesus or is it someone or something else? Who is receiving glory right now? Who is receiving glory right in this moment? There is so much freedom when we can get rid of the box that is causing us to be offended. Because that's how we become offended. You see, the Pharisees had a very narrow idea of what God ought to be doing and ought not to be doing. And, and Jesus seemed to delight in crossing the lines all of the time, including healing on the Sabbath and hanging out with sinners and, and all this kind of stuff. And it bugged them because they had a very limited idea of what God 
could or not could not do. And unfortunately, oh, we can be in the same boat. I've, I've been there. I know what that boat looks like. I don't know if it's a boat, but I know what being there is like. When we limit God, it causes us to be offended. And we get upset with God because we don't even recognize what is true and what is not. And, and um, ironically, here's the thing. When you become offended, you, and which happens when, you're, when we're in fear, um, it stops you from receiving the blessing. It disqualifies you from God's blessing. So you see, God does those things to bless. If I have a friend who is blind, okay, or sick, God heals them. If I love my friend, I should be happy about that. Right? But if I don't think God can do it, I won't be happy about that. I will be upset that that happened because God's not supposed to do it. Well, they've been deceived, they've been lied to, whatever. I'm not blessed. My friend is blessed. I'm not. See, Satan is very limited. For example, healing. I, I, I'm supposed to be preaching here, but I have to be teaching a little bit too. Demonic healing. There is such a thing. What they do is they take, they're causing the sickness, they take it off of one person, they put it on somebody else. So this person gets healed, that person gets sick. That's how they operate. When Jesus heals, he does put it on another person. Him. By his stripes you are healed. So nobody else gets sick. So demons can do some things. They have no interest really in healing anybody other than to lead somebody in more and more deception and a lie. But Jesus takes it all upon himself. He sets people free. That's what he came to do. He said, tell John about all the things you see and you hear. That all of this is happening to declare the reality of who I am. And blessed are you if you don't get offended in me. Because what's the opposite? Well, I'm going to praise God. My friend who was blind, now he sees. What if it's yourself? Uh, you know, when we sing the song, I was blind, now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Unless you're getting offended and it's lousy. And you can't be blessed. If you are getting offended, you will not be blessed. The, the other thing I, I want you to notice. It is by fleshly ways of thinking. It is wonderful to experience the Holy Spirit. And it's lousy to watch somebody else experience the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? Well, when you experience the Holy Spirit, you start crying. You might start laughing. You might fall down. God will start doing all kinds of stuff. There'll be dreams and visions. You might look like a total nut. But God is doing something so wonderful that it is beyond our understanding. But it's not fun to watch that. It's not fun to watch that. But, but if you know the one who's doing it, and you love another person, and you know it's the Lord because you know his voice, you're actually going to be blessed instead of being offended. You're going to be blessed because of what God's doing. You will have grace for them when they're ugly crying, when they're weeping before the Lord, when God is needing out healing and salvation and deliverance and all of that. You're going to have so much grace for them because you're watching what God is doing for your beloved brother or sister. It is a wonderful thing if you cannot get offended. Now, why am I saying all this? I'm not here to offend you. I'm, but I will if that's what you need to get offended, I'm going to offend you. Not because I want to, but if I feel you need to. Like parents, you're not there to discipline your children, but you will discipline them if they need to. If we ask for more of God, if we ask for more of God, you're going to get more of God. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. If you call unto him, and in Uganda they say, this is Jesus' phone number. You call unto him, he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. The problem is, you won't know. And that's where they will insult your box. Because you, they won't fit. God will answer you. He will show you great and mighty things, and you won't know. Amen? Amen. If you're calling out to the Lord, don't be offended that he answers. If you pick up the phone, don't be offended when you hear his voice on the other end. Amen. Saying, you called unto me, and I gave you a promise in my word. If you call me, I will answer you. Amen. And I will take you by the hand, and I'll show you great and mighty things. 
that you do not know. Because in, in that same passage of 1 Corinthians where it says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the good that God has for those who love him, it also says he does reveal them by his spirit. As you ask him, he will show you. As you call to him, he will answer. As you ask, you will receive. Yeah. Don't be offended that you've gotten. If you are serious about asking for more of God, and only if you're serious, I'm not saying this to scold you, but only if you're serious, <laughs> you're going to have to realize God's going to honor your box, but he won't fit in it. So don't be surprised when you see God do something that's not in your experience, because he's going to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. And he will show you them so you can know them. Amen. You know, I, I love in the Psalms where it says, He made his acts known to Israel, but his ways known to Moses. Yeah. And, and we call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles, but it should be called the Ways of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You, know, you need to know the ways. Israel just saw the outward act and they got offended half the time and they all died in the wilderness because of it. Many Christians are perishing in the wilderness. Because you won't receive what God wants to do. He fed them 40 years from manna, it was not enough. He led them through the wilderness, the shoes didn't wear, wear out, it was not enough. He fed them water out of the rock twice, and it wasn't enough. Amen. How many of us are in that place? How many of us are in that place? I was in that place. Don't stay there. Amen. We need to repent of our box. Amen. And to realize God will not fit. Because the opposite is so true. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Blessed are you if you can receive what God wants to do in your life. Blessed are you when you surrender. We sang songs of surrender. We sang songs of worship. We sang songs of praise. Why did we do that? Why do we do that? Hopefully it's because we mean it. Because we actually want to surrender. Because we actually want to come into his presence and to walk with him. Amen. To be blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now some of you are offended. Some of you might be unhappy. Some of you might be saying, oh my goodness, what kind of box did I make? It doesn't contain a lot of stuff. I, I know I had that kind of box. It was very small. Um, you might be offended right now. That's okay. Bring your box to the Lord. Come with your box to the Lord. He will honor it. He won't fit it, but he will honor it. And ask, Lord, I want to know you so well that I will recognize the lie of the enemy. So I'll be blessed by you, Lord, because I love the truth. And your word is true. And you, Lord, are true. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite us all to stand. See, God wants to bless this church. He wants to bless this region. He wants to bless your families. He wants to bless every community around here. But he won't be able to do it if we're getting offended. Because the very will be offended by the very thing God wants to give you as a blessing. And instead of receiving it as a blessing, we receive it as offense. And that keeps us from walking in that blessing. So we're going to come before the Lord. We're going to repent of our box. We're going to ask the Lord for true discernment to recognize the true from the false. So we won't be held in fear. Amen? So Father, we're coming before you in the name of Jesus. All of us, as a body. Father, we ask your forgiveness, Lord, for thinking you could fit in our box. For thinking that we can understand everything that you are and all that you have for us. When your word clearly reminds us that we cannot. Lord, as we surrender to you with our box, we thank you, Lord, that you do honor our box. You meet us right where we are. And you don't chide us. But, Lord, we, we also confess that you will not fit in our theological box. Yes, that we shall see things we don't understand. But, Lord, if we walk with you, we will know you at work. Yes, and so, Lord, we will have not only your blessing, but grace for one another. In the coming days and the season, Lord God, where you are moving in such a mighty way. Father, we want the blessing. It costs you everything to give it to us. For the blessing is your very life. 
Lord, help us to receive it. To believe that we can receive it, Father God. And to walk closer with you, Lord. That, Father, your hand will be upon us, Lord God. That you will lead us and guide us, Father God. And we will see your hand move across this region, my God, and around the world in a mighty way, Lord God, as your people surrender to you. And Lord, it has to begin right here. It has to begin right now. Lord, we believe in you. Help us to be blessed and not offended. In Jesus' name, amen. As you lay down offense, as you bring it before the Lord, whatever it might be, you'll be blessed. If you hold on to it, you won't be. That's all there is to it. So I pray you go out with joy and be led forth at peace. That if there is anything in your heart, that you'll take time to bring it before the Lord. And you'll ask the Lord, Lord, I need to hear your voice so clearly that I recognize the enemy. One final note, bankers don't spend a lot of time looking at the counterfeit. They spend a lot of time looking at the real thing. So when the counterfeit comes, they recognize it immediately. That's what we have to be doing, amen? So go with the joy of the Lord. Go with his blessing, his peace. Leave your offense behind. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May it cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you peace. Amen. 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 We may be dismissed.